It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Timothy Kosinski, DDS, MAGD of smilecreator.net. Uh, Tim's bio is, uh, you're going to think I'm making all this up. Dr. Tim Kosinski is an adjunct clinical professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry and serves on the editorial review board of Reality, the information source for aesthetic dentistry, the Michigan Dental Association Journal, and became the editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He is a past president of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. Dr. Kosinski received his DDS from the University of Detroit Mercy Dental School and his Mastership in Biochemistry from Wayne State University School of Medicine. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology, Implant Dentistry, the International Congress of Oral Plantologists, and the American Society of Osteointegration. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and received his Mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. Dr. Kosinski has received many honors, including fellowship in the American and International Colleges of Dentists and the Academy of Dentistry International. He is a member of OKU and the Pierre Fichard Academy. Dr. Kosinski was the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry Alumni Association's Alumnus of the Year, and in 2009 and 2014 received the Academy of General Dentistry's Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition. Dude, that is amazing. Dr. <laughs> Kosinski has published over 150 articles on the surgical and prosthetic phases of implant dentistry and was a contributor to the textbooks Principles and Practices of Implant Dentistry and 2010's Dental Implantation Technology. He was featured on Noble BioCare's Noble Vision and Lester's extensively. Dude, it is an honor that you're on my show today. Thank you so <laughs> much for coming on. So, Thanks. so I appreciate so that. I wanna, this, this is why I brought you on. 6,000 kids just walked out of dental school 60 days ago, and every one of them saying the same thing on Dental Town. We didn't place one implant in dental school. They didn't teach us one single case. And then there's a guy like you who's standing on the top of the pyramid, you know, three decades later. How long have you been doing this? Is three decades. <laughs> three decades later. So walk. So what I want you to do, walk these kids up the stairs. Where do they start? They, they just they, – they have – $350,000 of student loans and didn't sink, place a single root form implant. How do you get from graduation day to where you are? Boy, that's, that's great, Howard. I appreciate you asking me that question because I, I always say in my lectures, I was blessed with phenomenal mentors in, early in my career, and they elevated um, the way I could practice incredibly. And it's so nice at this time of my life to be able to give back. So at my university, at the University of Detroit, I work with the young students all the time, and I see what they're up to. At our school, they get to work on models with implants, so they're introduced to implants, but you're right, they don't, they don't place. And oftentimes, they're told that they can't place, which is silly. So my suggestion to them is for them to get as much education as possible. You know, when we went to school, it's, it's different today, and I, and I feel old when I say that. It's not the way it was when I was in school, but <laughs> it, their kids are so incredibly smart. They're, they're intelligent, and they just have to have mentors. And I think, you know, dentistry is, is a mentor profession, and it's nice when you can follow uh, under somebody's wing. So what I'm involved with is, is I love education. I'm involved in, say, the Engel Institute, which is an implant training program, three-day program where the young doctors, we've had people right out of school, and we've had 80-year-olds take this course, and they learn the important aspects for posterior implants. Let, let them get proficient because they can do it. The general dentists out there can do it and should be doing it, but they need help. They need education and proper education. They can't do it with a half-a-day course. That's when they get into trouble. So with a, with a mentor, with a little bit of help, with a little education, with a little more investment, not a lot of investment, they can get started with implant dentistry. I look in their eyes, Howard, and I see what a great life they're going to have. I mean, I've had a great life, as you had a great life in dentistry. And you know, I look in their eyes. Hey, and, you never and, met my ex. What, what, what do you know? <laughs> what do you know? You're just making this stuff up. Hey, Doc, you, 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 drop, you drop the Engel Institute, and they're, they're thinking, uh, where, what, who, who's Engel? T talk, talk about more. And you teach at Engel? I do. Uh, you know, he's a, a friend of mine. Um, he started in Southern California, since moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and we have programs in Charlotte, Detroit, outside of Phoenix, and Houston. And it's a three-day program, a beginning program, 
of, of getting started with the practical aspects of implant dentistry without a big investment. Say, say the th cities again, Charlotte? Charlotte, Detroit, Glendale, Arizona, outside of Phoenix, and Houston. And, and outside of Houston. Uh, Glendale, when, when, are you, when are you guys in Glendale? Glendale, well, you know, it, it, like twice a year he does Glendale, twice a year he does Houston, three times a year we do Detroit. So I'd have to look at the dates. I'm not exactly sure of the dates offhand. But what's unique about the program, Howard, is we go through two days of very intense lecturing, didactic, hands-on. But on the third day, that's the, the attendees come to my office, and we allow them to place an implant in one of my patients under a very strict protocol, a recipe, so to speak, under direct supervision of one of the mentor dentists, for instance, Dr. Engel or myself. Very unique. That's how you learn on patients. So now when you go to the course in Glendale, do the students get to place implants? A implant on one of our patients. We provide the, the, the patient. They do them. in Glendale. Yes. So 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 my so say the guy comes from New Mexico. His New Mexico yeah. state license will allow him to place. Great question. The reason we do those states is because they're open states. You don't need a special state licensure to, to practice there. Really? Yeah. That's why we do them in those, in those four states. Huh. And you know what I was thinking? What might add value? Um, um, you could have, uh, when we release this show, we should have Dr. Uh, Engel do this and have him the day after. Would that be a one, two? Absolutely. I, I, absolutely absolutely you'll, you'll enjoy him he's he's quite yeah. an educator okay real practical no fat no nonsense no ego just let's learn together okay um I, i'm gonna go back uh, now i want you to put your dad hat on some yeah. of these students they say you know maybe i'm not maybe blood and guts is scary maybe i shouldn't be pulling wisdom teeth and placing them maybe i should go into something pretty like invisalign and sleep apnea and what would you say to this 25-year-old kid who uh, is just kind of scared, you know, the fear thing. Well, you know, I think education is the key. I'm very active in the Academy of General Dentistry. Very important that you get high-quality education. Regardless, you know, we all find our niche. I found my niche. Implants made sense to me 100 years ago when it was experimental, so to speak. So we all, we all find our niche in what we like to do. And But I think it's important, it's imperative that they – kind of guide themselves and get as much education as they can and find out what they like doing and what they don't like doing. Um, you know, some people like surgery, some people don't. Some people like braces. I don't. I don't do any orthodontics at all. People look at me like, why? You just love blood and guts. Admit it. Like, uh, you, wear, guts. you wear a hockey mask when you're driving to yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> do you? Have you ever worn a hockey mask while driving to work I knowing you were going to get into some blood and guts? <laughs> not, not, I have not done that. So... But, but you said something extremely profound. You know, my, my office will be uh, 30 years old uh, um, next uh, May 11th, and you and I both have our MAGD. Now, then I've done this three decades. It seems like the dentist who joined the AGD and started, you know, you got to audit out your friends. You know, you, you're in dental school, some of your friends thought the sky was falling, dentistry was horrible, blah, blah. But it seemed like when you joined the AGD, I don't know if it was so much the courses or hanging with the right flock of birds, birds of a feather flock together. But I look back, I think the most game-changing thing I ever did in my entire career was deciding to join the AGD and get my FAGD and MAGD. Would, would talk, talk about, do you agree, disagree? What are your thoughts on that? I, I agree. I, you know, I'm very active in the AGD, both in the Michigan and national. I became the associate editor of the National AGD Journal, so it does mean a lot to me. And, you know, there's about almost 30,000 members. And these are, these are the, the primo. These are the ones that want to keep accelerating. When you stagnate, you get bored. When you get bored, you get depressed and you hate dentistry. Dentistry is a tough job. It's a great profession, but a really tough job. And, yeah, surrounding yourself with people that are goal-oriented, reaching that, that, that ring and getting a fellowship and a mastership and being uh, honored and, and awarded for that, it, it is special, and, and you're right. I think, I think the AGD members, the general dentists, are exceptional dentists. You know, you, you were asking me about, about the young kids, and, and um, you know, I'm a big believer. We're, we're, coming, we're coming to the age of, this, of the super GP, the super general dentist. Our patients want us to do all the work, but we have to have the training and feel competent and confident in being able to provide that service. 
your patients look at you and go, come on, can't you just do it? You do it. I don't want to go somewhere else. We just have to train ourselves properly. So um, when you and I were in school, you just got that tooth out by grabbing it and flexing your biceps and your triceps. And, and I remember my oral surgery instructor, he was a huge man. And he had his arm under the jaw and it, you could see his triceps popping out and all that kind of stuff. But now we... <laughs> You, you don't do it that way anymore. T talk about your uh, eight traumatic extractions. Well, that's really important to me. Um, here in Detroit, um, Dr. Richard Golden created what's called the Golden Physics Forcep, and it's a very, very unique tool. And we all like tools. Um, but anything that makes my job easier, as I get older, I want to save my eyes, my ears, my hands, my back. And any instrument that will help me do that is important. So it's an instrument that allows me to remove a tooth without that pulling and tugging and, and um, uh, bicep pressure and shoulder pressure and squeezing your hand. It's, it's, it's a lever. And it creates tension on the periodontal ligament, which allows me to lift a tooth up and out. We call it, it pops out. And if you've seen any of my videos, I call it magic because it's just saved my career. I don't think a day goes by that I don't pick up the physics forcep and remove a tooth, especially with all the implants that we do. Saving bone is very important. So it's to me, it's a remarkable tool. But again, educating is education is very important. At our dental school this weekend, we will probably see 70 patients. Uh, we bring doctors in, 15 to 20 doctors, and Th these doctors will extract teeth on real patients in a real setting and again become very proficient at a technique that may be difficult for many of us but can be very much simplified with the proper tools. Really is magic. So um, another question um, a lot of dentists have, not just kids coming out of school, but you know, when, when we were little, you, you never, after you extracted a tooth, you never put anything in its place. And now there's a lot of um, uh, people who uh, don't do that. They do a lot of uh, socket grafting. Um, so to graft or not to graft? Do you, do you graft every extraction? Do you t t talk about why, yeah. when, where, how? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, in, in this day, day and age, I say a few things have really changed dentistry. Number one, digital radiographs have changed the way we practice because it's, it's easy to it's quick to take an x-ray and we can see things. We can do contrasts. But the other thing that really changed dentistry is the internet because our patients are, are, they just, they have a toothache, they have a gum problem, they have a funny looking tooth, they just Google it and they get information. And they come to us expecting a certain amount of treatment. Now, again, implants have been very important to me. So maintaining bone, bone is gold in, in what I do. And when we can maintain bone, it's very important. So if I have to take a tooth out for whatever reason, periodontal or, or decay or trauma, it's important uh, when I'm explaining to the patient that not only are we removing the tooth, but we want to maintain that bone. When we lose a tooth, bone's going to shrink. It's going to shrink down and in. And it may make future treatment, whether it be a bridge or a partial or an implant, more difficult. And we all see that as, as dentists, right? We see the, hor the horse's saddle look. We're worried, you know, our young doctors, our, our established doctors, we're all worried about the nerve and the sinus and because we lose bone. So maintaining that bone is important. How do we do that? Well, if we, if we place a bone-filling material, whether it be a synthetic or a, uh, from another animal, from another species, or human bone, that will help maintain that ridge, which makes whatever we do in the future, a bridge, uh, a, a partial, a denture, or a dental implant, that much more effective. So it is important that we do that as long as we, again, train ourselves properly. But, but go through the terms of the bone could be synthetic, animal, your own bone, and other human bone. What, what are the other names of that? What, what's so, the, uh... so the, the gold standard is, is autogenous bone, the, the patient's own bone. We can harvest it from a site. We can take it from the chin. We can take it from the ramus. That's the, the gold standard. But it also means harvesting bone from another part of the jaw. We have bone that we can pick up from a bottle. We, it's called um, you know, an allograft material. It's from, from the same species, cadaver bone, purified. There's different types of uh, material. So, so cadaver there. bone would be allograft? 
Allograft, right. And so that material is placed. And remember, bone is alive in the body. It constantly changes over. I tell my patients, you know, if you break your arm in a cast for six weeks and it mends, oftentimes it mends stronger than it was before. So I'll tell my patients, you know, whatever we put in that socket, that hole is going to disappear. The body cells are going to eat it away. And as though we know them as osteoclasts, but as those cells eat away what we put in there, other cells right behind it lay down new bones. So whatever we put in there is going to be replaced in a period of time. So cadaver bone, allograft material is, is an important product that we have today. Some patients, no way, you're not putting another human bone in, in my body. Another, uh, you're not putting human bone from another, from another human in my body. And we do have alloplastic material like tricalcium phosphate or a material that I that really like. That would be the like. synthetic alloplastic. Synthetic. It's al tricalcium phosphate. It's calcium and phosphorus, which are, is the building block of our, our bone. And again, the body cells will eat it away and lay down new bone. I like that a lot. There's another material, another alloplastic material called osteogen, which is like a, uh, almost like a, a, a little bullet that is easy to maintain and place in the socket where we don't need a membrane, and we'll talk about that in a second, to protect our graft material. And then there's, there's um, a xenograft material, which is from another species, like a, a cow or a horse or pig. Um, I don't use those materials a lot because... Um, I like the, the, the whatever we put in a socket to be, be reformulated and regenerated. And so I stick with the allograft or the alloplastic materials uh, routinely. We can grow bone today. We can, we can grow walls. General dentists out there, as long as you get the proper education and learn the proper techniques. So what is your 80-20 rule? How are you, how are you bone um, um, grafting 80%? Do you, do you have a favorite that you mostly well, do? Well, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I work with three different materials mostly. And if I'm missing a wall, a, let's say a facial wall is gone, then I will use an allograft, human bone, and I will place a membrane. But when we place a membrane is something that is like, I tell my patients, it's like a Band-Aid that protects the graft material from invagination of soft tissue. In the body, we have a race between bone and gum, and gum is always going to win. And as, as we were taught, a socket heals from the apex, from the tip, up towards the crest. So what we don't want is we don't want that gum tissue, the epithelium, to invaginate into the socket. We want to protect it. So we put a membrane, and there's different kinds of membranes, but a membrane, which is like a Band-Aid. And when done properly, when positioned correctly, we can grow walls effectively. Now, if we have a socket like a uh, waffle cone, an ice cream cone, where all the walls are intact, then I can use an allograft, use human bone, I can use my synthetic tricalcium phosphate, or I can use my osteogen plug and place it in that socket. And we will get a very, very positive result. What, your doc what doctors don't want to do is remove a tooth and not put anything in there. When we don't put anything in there, the bone is going to shrink and it's going to make whatever we want to do in the future more difficult. You know, when you and I were little and got out of school, it was indemnity insurance. Overheads were much lower. We would just submit the fee and the insurance would pay. They'd just say, okay, we're, we're going to pay 100% of that, 80% of that, but it's our fees. Now it's gone the other way where these indemnities said, uh, forget that. We're going to tell you the fee. They went with a PPO that 82% of dentists take, and the fees are 40% lower. So a lot of dentists, um, you know, they want the, so many of the procedures they do are a loss leader. They want to get into things that are profitable, like use their loss leader PPO practice to like do 10 Invisalign cases a month and they're making bank. Are these bone grafting things, are they usually covered by PPOs or are these, great, are great these off the, uh, not on the plan? Not, they're not on the plan. So you, the doctors will charge out for the extraction. Grafting is not going to be covered. However, think about what we're trying to accomplish here. We're trying to prepare this patient for the future. It's not a hard, it's not a hard discussion to say, you know what, we can take the tooth out. It needs to come out. But if we don't do anything, you may not be able to have, say, an implant later. Um, we don't have to overcharge for it. We can buy products that are reasonable in, in cost, knowing that it is an out-of-pocket expense for the patient. 
However, we're preparing for very lucrative procedures down the road. Implant dentistry, abutments, crowns, bridges, overdentures, things like that. And all the insurance carriers now are covering those more, more, um, more expensive procedures that we're doing. So what, how much does it cost to do a typical grafting and how much do uh, your students typically charge for something like this? Well, you know, and, and, you know, again, cost is a difficult thing. I would say, uh, depending on which product you use, an osteogen plug may, may cost you out of pocket, don't quote me exactly, maybe 40 bucks, $40, where a bottle of allograft material may be $100. You have maybe have a membrane that may cost you another $40. So in product, you may have $150 in 40, 50 to $150 in material well, costs that you're purchasing. But that's but a huge the, difference in a $40 oxygen plug. Well, it, than, it all depends. You know, there, there's indications. You know, oxygen plug I'll use when I have all the walls a intact. A waffle. Basically clean. A waffle cone, right. Okay. So, you know, what you use, again, there's a lot of stuff out there. There's a lot of different materials and a lot of products. And what I teach, you know, I, I teach what I, I use and what works best in my hands. There's a hundred things out there. There's a hundred speakers talking about different products, but I can tell you what, what I do every day and what works in my hands very, very well. So if you have a hundred and fifty dollar cost, what's a fair price to charge for that procedure? In dental school, again, when you said when we were little, three, four times our lab bill, right, was what we charged. I know it's not necessarily today. So you know, is four hundred dollars a fair fee? And I think the dentists out there need to feel comfortable, and their staff needs to feel comfortable with explaining the procedure, the benefits of the procedure, and, and having a cost that, that is easy, that rolls off the tongue, that's easy for them to present to their patients. So you would just patients tell the patient that, you know, you pull this tooth and it's going to leave a big hole, and for the price of just half of your iPhone, we could fill that. <laughs> there right? you go. That's perfect. For just that's half perfect. an iPhone, we could... Uh, so, so that that is amazing. Uh, you know, it, I, I got very scared because I have just lectured in uh, Tokyo and Paris and London where the government dental insurance gives you $100 for a molar root canal. And none of these guys would talk to me about this on the podcast, but off the record they'd say, well, I'm not going to spend a, an hour doing a molar root canal for 100 bucks when I could get paid 90 bucks to pull the tooth, and then the insurance doesn't cover implants, so I'd rather just pull the damn tooth and then charge you 1000 bucks for an implant. And then they were also saying that, um, that uh, when it comes to post, Posts were always indicated for the billing charge of another hundred dollars. So um, every root canal had a post because you know the government's only giving it. So you got to beware of free, and uh, you know, That's and you know. So whenever so when someone's promising you free healthcare, I mean, what what does free mean? Does that mean the government's going to come to my door, arrest me, and take me to my office, and I do free dentistry all day, or does it mean they're going to reimburse me so low I won't even do a good job? Because I'll go bankrupt if I do a good job. I mean, could you do a molar root canal for a hundred bucks? No. Yeah, and it's nope. weird because they're in Tokyo pulling up in these beautiful Accords and, and you know Lexuses and have three hundred dollar pair of shoes, and they want to they want a root canal for a hundred bucks from the government. Right. So so right. so what so would you say that implants? Um, what percent of an a typical implant practice is not covered by a PPO fee schedule, so that you could actually charge? A profitable margin and do this for a profit because in these PPO practices when we go in there and look at the numbers they're routinely doing cleanings exams and x-rays and fillings at a loss yeah wow. so are these PPOs are they are they covering implants and and are they starting to set the fees on that and squeeze the margin out of it or is this still virgin territory of cost plus profit equals price as opposed to PPO here's the price subtract your budget I mean, subtract your profit. Now you got this little budget to try to make a Lexus out of a out of a Toyota. Well, you know, it's good. That's a, that's another good question. I'm not. I, I I don't know if I can address that exactly. I'm kind of a unique guy. I, you know, I've never participated in any insurance in my entire practice. So I fill out the forms, and the patients are reimbursed directly. So I I've never been into that 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 field. Um, yeah, I've heard the complaints that everybody had. So we're kind of unique uh, in that respect. Um, as I understand it, most insurance companies are covering implants dentistry because it's it's works. 
you know, Dr. Christensen, Gordon Christensen will say, you know, the life, the aesthetics of a, a, of a bridge is, is five years and the function is 10 years. And they realize that implants may, may last longer. However, they haven't changed the fee schedule or they're, they're, you know, they're only paying $1,200 a year or $1,500 a year uh, as reimbursement. So most of these procedures, whether it be PPO, whatever, regardless of what you have, the majority of the cost is out of pocket. So those people that want implant dentistry because of the internet, because of their friends, because it's, it's mainstream today, um, are going to come up with the, with the fees. You know, if your, your TV breaks, you, don't, you go to Best Buy and you, you buy a new HD TV, you don't think twice about it. And for people who want a quali certain quality of life, they're going to pay for their dentistry. So insurance isn't really a part of implant dentistry at this point. Um, you'll get, they're going to get a little bit of coverage, but if they want it, they're going to come up with the fees. Now, what's a fair fee? Are the cost of doing business with implant dentistry has come way down. You know... Ten years ago, 75% of my, my implant surgeries were done under IV sedation. They were two-hour procedures, two-and-a-half-hour procedures. Now our procedures, because of the, the instruments, the tooling, the design of the implants, many of my implant procedures are 15-minute procedures. I'd rather do an implant than a DO composite on tooth number two. Um, and so the, the marketability, the financial rewards are, are incredible for us in dentistry. And our patients want it. They come to us wanting implant dentistry so so i'm going to go back so talk more about the engel institute uh so so um podcasting um is 30 and under uh we we passed 1 million downloads on itunes so the show is uh, amazing because uh well no they're free they're high quality i get amazing guests like you on here and uh they're driving to work that's what they always they tell me they got an hour commute and um so she's sitting here driving down the road, and she's like, okay, um, you're saying go to the Engel Institute. Uh, is that going to tell me what uh, implant system? She just went to the last uh, ADA convention, and there were 175 implant yeah. companies. That's and right. she doesn't have the time to go do research on 175 companies. So, so you you're were earlier talking about mentorship. So if she chooses you as a mentor, what is the Engel Institute? I mean, is it? Is it one? Is it a weekend? One weekend course? Is it there's three courses? How much does it cost? What implant system would you recommend? Give her more details so she can make a decision. So, so the the program has been around a long time, and I've been involved with it for nine years. So I have a lot of respect for, it and I think it's a wonderful training. So. Mentoring One, we call Mentoring One, is a three-day program, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, two days of intense lecturing, no fat, no ego, no, no showing wonderful things, creating a recipe. Day three, you come into my office, and we allow you to place an implant in one of my patients under direct supervision of one of the mentor dentists. A phenomenal experience. Well, you, you yeah. said these courses were in Charlotte, Detroit, Glendale, and Houston, but is that offer to go in your office just if you're yes. in the Detroit course? No, no, no. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. My office is, that's where we do surgeries. We do them in private offices. The Engel Institute in Charlotte is a beautiful 7,500 square foot state-of-the-art facility, but basically they're all run the same. We provide the patients. You come into the office. You know, we lecture in a, in a we lecture at our university and then we come to my office to actually physically do the surgery. So it's, it's a wonderful start. Um, how much it is, I'm not really sure. I want to say it's probably around $5,000 to do that. Okay? For the three-day course? For the three-day course. When you're finished, so when you're what finished. Would, so what would an implant buildup and crown typically cost? Um, cost the patient? Yeah. Cost for yeah. So. What, what, if, if this person paid $5,000, you know, 96% of crowns, or sent in one unit at a time. The most common implant, I mean, people show all these all on fours, but the most common implant is a molar right. implant crown. How much would a molar implant crown cost? I would say it averages anywhere, you know, in our area, Detroit. Detroit's a tough area, $2,500 to $3,500 implant okay, above Okay, so, so kids, listen. You go learn, I mean, if, when you pay or uh, go to pay $5,000 and go to an orthodontic course, one case, you get your money back. I mean, you go to an implant course and if you come back and you place two implants for a first malaria, you, you, you got your money back. I mean, this Absolutely. is a no brainer. So you have mentoring one, 
and that's a three-day course, five grand. You're going to have to go home and place two molar implants and crowns to get your money back. Um, is there a mentoring two, three, four? And, and then what we do, what we do and let's just go back to mentoring on real, real, real quick here. So we, we, what's important is to be able to diagnose correctly. Pick the right cases. Pick the ones that you know are gonna, you're going to feel comfortable doing and get competent and confident. We do have a mentoring two, and mentoring two is just done in Charlotte. So the so the cases it, you want to pick, you want you want to pick number eight on no. a really good looking girl on a high <laughs> lip line, right? Did, did I get it right? Wrong. Uh, wrong. <laughs> you want a <laughs> short, fat, bald guy so that when he smiles, none of his teeth shows, and if it fails, and you say, "I'm sorry, it didn't work," he says, "I told you to pull it in the beginning. You were the one who wanted to save it." That's the we, best we, patient. We recommend that you do 20 bit post, posterior ones before you go to the front of the mouth. And Mentoring two, we go to the front of the mouth. It's a four day program. Okay, but, we, but back, but back, but back, back, first one. What, what is I? What, what's the what's the uh, low hanging fruit on place an implant? Wh which which teeth? Bicuspids and molars. First uh, upper molars, and lower. Upper and lower. First second bicuspids. First molar. First and second bicuspids and first molar and maxillar mandible, it doesn't matter. Correct. Okay. So then mentoring two after you've done 20 posteriors. Mentoring two. And it's not a continuum. You can do it in any order you want. But mentoring two is extractions, grafting. We have a periodontist um, that comes in. We do soft tissue grafting. And we move to the anterior. We sh show you the rules, again, the recipe to move to the anterior part of the mouth, which is, which is awesome. Um, so, and again, on Saturday of the course, we do live surgery, we do extractions, we do grafting, we do sinus tenting, we do tissue repositioning, uh, attached gingiva repositioning on our patients. We provide the patient, you get the experience. Awesome. Just awesome. Same price as one? I don't know. That, you know what? They'd have to go to engleinstitute.com to find the fees. You know, I don't collect the money, so I don't get really involved with that. Okay. So that's just elevating your, your uh, education to move to the front of the mouth and understanding soft tissue a little bit better. Mentoring three is incredible. Mentoring three is guided surgery. So every doctor does a guided surgery case. The last case, last mentoring three we did, I think we placed 120 implants on a Saturday. Incredible experience. Okay. Um, lot, lots of questions here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't have an implant system. I, I'm driving to work right now. Uh, do I need to buy a system? Do you only teach one system? Um, well, that's a great question, Hart, too. You know, you have, we have to teach something, okay? And, and the, Dr. Engel has evolved over several systems over the years. Currently, we have, uh, we have merged with the Strawman implant system. Strawman wow. Implant is the number one implant system in the world. Uh, they came to Todd and uh, really want to be a part of his family. And what's unique, and this is important for your listeners, um, Strawman is a, is a very precise Swiss-engineered system that was done mostly by specialists. We are now training general dentists to put a high-quality implant system in. Now, the Engel Institute, the, the training, again, I've, I've said this a few times, is a recipe so the implant itself is really irrelevant because we teach you the techniques to be able to, uh, to place a proper implant. Um, but right now, because we have to place something, we're not going to place eight different systems. We're using the Strawman system, which is pretty amazing. Well, you know, I'm a dentist, and, but I also got an MBA and Master's of Business Administration from Arizona State University, and it's just amazing how... Strawman went and bought the number one implant system in Korea, Megagen. Then they went to Brazil, which places more implants in the United States, and bought their number one implant system, Neodent. Then they went to Israel, bought their number one implant, MIS. I mean, they basically bought every Michael Jordan implant company in every major market. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, how do you yeah. do that? So, 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 so th then this is the confusing thing on Dentaltown. So if you buy the Strawman implant system, do you... Is that also the Megagen implant system, the MIS from Israel, the Neodent from Brazil? Do all the burrs and bolts and how, how does that work? No, they're all they're all different. Every system has a different surgical kit. 
Uh, the, the procedures so are... So which surgical kit would you recommend she get? The Strawman or the, the Megagen they just bought out of Korea? We're teaching the Strawman bone level tapered implant. BLT, bacon, lettuce, and tomato oh implant. Oh my God, you just won my heart over. A fat boy is <laughs> never going to say no to a BLT. So it's a called bone level what? Tapered. Bone level bone tapered. Bone level tapered. And when you, come to the, when you come to the course, you work with a system. Whether you purchase it or not, is, there's not it's not a high sell at all. It's really just How to make it easy. How much is the system? Um, you know, Dr. Engel, you know, I think he, he engineered a, a, a really great, a really great uh, deal. For, it, it brought the price of the implant very competitive with all the other systems that you mentioned, more or less. You know, again... It's a business decision with the doctor, what they feel comfortable with, what, what's used in, the, in their area. Uh, you know, implants are, are popular in different parts of the country, but Dr. Engel decided he wanted to work with the best. They came to him, the biggest, the brightest, and it's a really good fit. It's pretty amazing. Know, the support is incredible. I know he wants to work with only the best because he never called me. <laughs> hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play devil's advocate because these are what these, I mean, like I say, podcasters are under 30. This is what they're hearing, okay? Yep. They go get a job at a dental office in Parsons, Kansas. And you know what every single periodontist and oral surgeon says that's placed a 1,000 implants? Guided, mm -hmm. guided surgery. What do you need, training wells? You know what you need to do? You need to take them damn training wells off. I place a 1,000 implants on a pano, and then you kids want these glorified training rails the rest of your life, just grow up, man. You got a tooth in front. You got a tooth behind. There's two walls. Why do you need training wheels? That's what they're hearing. So yeah. then they got these younger tech lovers, and even some of the older guys that love it, the only ones that love that, they love technology first. So, so my question to you is, guided surgery or be a real surgeon and man up and just lay a big flap and eyeball it? Great, great, great question. What we, what we train. I mean, you know they're hearing this, right? I, oh, I, you know, I, I, we, I just did a course in Charlotte. We did 21 surgeries last Saturday. I had young guys right out of school um, working in clinics. We had one of the biggest clinics in Detroit. He came in uh, and said, my boss owns all these centers. He took the angle course. He wants me to be trained. We train on x-rays, on digital x-rays. CT is amazing. It's a great tool. I have one in my office. I don't know if I'd practice without it. I don't necessarily do guided surgery with every case, but it does help me become a better diagnostician. Okay. So anytime we have a tool that makes us more proficient, it's a good tool. But can, can the young dentists out there do implants without guided? Yeah. I placed 12,000 without guided. Absolutely. So you've done 12,000 without guided. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but you know, there are cases today where, yeah, you know, we did 31, 31 guided cases the first quarter this year. And when it's needed, it's, it's cool to have because it makes, makes me proficient. It takes a, a four hour surgery into uh you know, a, a, an hour surgery. So it's a tool and, and w this technology just makes us better dentists. It, it does. We can see things that we couldn't see before. So, so if they sign up for this course, they'll get a rocking hot deal on the Strawman set. Which, yep. uh, the, um, but here's, here's what I perceive on the best implant system. When, when I know any townie who just got it going, they had a rep in the field. They had a human. It, it was a relationship. And when I see people saying, well, I saved so much money because I bought these online and I bought them from Russia for half the price, but you don't have a friend. You don't have someone going on the ground. And every person I know who's placing 100 implants a year has a rep buddy, physical person in the field, even if it's just like, well, what about this? And they go, oh, you know what you should do? You should call Dr. Uh, um, you know, Gettleman or you should call Tim or, you, you know, just or they're arranging or, or we, we go to a bar after work and it's six guys that have had the same issue in the last week. And but. The rep in the field. So, so do you agree with that or disagree with that? Uh, you know, I, I love mentoring. And you know what's, what's unique about our program is we're there forever. They can email us. They can send us cases. It goes right to the center. And the, the question is sent to one of the mentors, and we answer it very promptly. It, mentoring is very important in what we do. And it's nice to have somebody there to say, hey, Tim, 
I have this x-ray. Here's the ball bearing. I measured it. What do you think? What can I do? Can I do this one? Is this one that I should do? It, it, you're absolutely 100% right. You And you want quality reps, experienced reps out there that will be there to help you with your cases, will be there to help you order the right products, will be help, help, helpful in getting the, the proper deals, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so I, I agree with that completely. You know, I'm at a different level. And, and when I teach, I say, you know, I've been doing this a long, long time. Since 1984, I've been placing implants, and we've gone through a lot. And I'm really good at what I do. But this technology and my experiences, it kind of makes us equal now. All of a sudden, my experience isn't as critical because we have this technology that makes us hear and see and feel things that we couldn't do before. It's a good time to be a dentist. It's a really good time to be a dentist. Well, I'm so old that uh, I thought, you know, when, when I hear someone say a CVCT is the greatest thing that ever happened in oral radiology, I'm so old that I remember the greatest upgrade was on the panda when they upgraded to putting an R on the one side and an L on the other. <laughs> You're right. I seriously right. thought that was the coolest thing yeah. ever. That, that was like the biggest invention in, uh, in panos. You remember that yeah. when that came out? Yeah. Like, well, how about electric hand pieces? How about getting rid of the belt on your hand piece? So I want to go, <laughs> you know? go into some uh, – um, I don't want to talk about what anybody knows. This is Dentistry Uncensored. We talk about what everybody uh, gets uh, upset and excited about. Um, there's a huge um, dilemma war going on with mini implants versus major implants. So one school of thought says, come on, um, all you implant guys – Talk about making Porsches and Mercedes, like, like um, Clear Choice, all on four. That's $25,000 an arch, and Clear Choice only does about 18,000 arches a year, but there's 330 million people in America, and for every person that can pay 25000 for one arch, there's probably 10 grandmas who don't got that kind of money with a lower denture. So some people say, when grandma comes in with a denture, I just put two minis or four minis, ball and no rings and all that. And then other people just, they just think that's outrageous that real doctors place root forms and, and blah, blah. So, so are you a mini or a maxi? I mean, do you, do you, do you think, do you think minis are, uh, are amateurs and, and shouldn't be done or, or do you, I mean, I'm from Kansas. There's more people living in a barn or a trailer in Kansas. than can pay 25,000 arch for all on four. So what's your thoughts on minis? You know, you know, Howard, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch that a little bit. When my patients come in, um, you, you talk to them. You, I'm a big believer in communication, number one. My job is not to sell them anything. My job is to educate and instruct and make them aware of what's available. The final decision on the treatment, whether it be a Porsche or a Mercedes or a Chevy, being from Detroit, we'll say Chevy, um, is based on budget. You know, in, in today's economy... Um, it's not the way it used to be, and people struggle, and people live paycheck to paycheck, and, and they're, very, they're very specific on what they want to spend their money on. So the final decision is going to be the patients, and I place mini implants when it's appropriate. I have no problem with that, converting a denture, because it does improve the quality of their life dramatically. Is that my favorite thing to do? Is that my first choice? No, I would rather put two endosseous as opposed to four mini implants, but I've done hundreds of cases with four mini implants and, and have had good success. And again, improving the quality of their life. So we have to listen to our patients, what they can afford, what they, what they want, uh, what their expectations are. You're not going to do fixed bridge work. You're not going to do an all on four on four mini implants, obviously, but maybe that's not what they need. Maybe they just want to have a denture that doesn't fall out of their mouth when they sneeze or when they go to dinner with their friends. So I think there's a place for all treatments from the very bottom to the very top. There's, there's a place for conventional dentures in today's environment. But go into, but detail, I think, I think but go into detail, why would you prefer two endosseous implants over four minis? T tell them uh, why. Because you've well, done both. Yeah. That's what I love about you. you you've done surgical. You've done, what did you say, 12,000 implants 12, non-surgical? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. I, so, so why, why do you like two endosseous over four minis? Well, I think that I think the attachments themselves, we have locator attachments now. We used to do bars. So they, they're easy to change. It's easy to get increased retention. It's easy to add on to later. 
you know, if the patient wins the lottery or comes into some financial reward, it's easy to add a few more and give them more stability. Uh, with the with the O rings, with the with the um, mini implants, we're kind of locked into. We either do a a soft reline or we'll have some kind of rubber O rings. And you have to remember, again, you and I are older. Things wear out with time. I'm wearing out with time, right? And what's great today may not be so great five years and ten years down the road. So, um, you know, placing four mini implants works works fine. You're going to lose a certain amount of mini implants, you know, and I, and I think the statistics say about 40%, but they're very inexpensive, so they're easy to replace. They're easy to reline uh, an existing denture with them, where I think the end osseous implants today are modern end osseous implants are really intended to last the lifetime. They, they, we don't see bone loss. We don't see problems with our end osseous implants that we saw in, in the past. So, you know, I think there's indications for both. It's not a right or wrong. It's being able to give the proper retention, the proper quality of life for our patients. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going through common threads on Dental Town. We have, we have 50 sections. Uh, one of them is implantology. A lot, lot of people are asking, can I bill a lot of this to medical? I mean, we, we got this new Obamacare. We got Medicaid. We got Medicare. Uh, does, does Medicaid, should I get into medical billing if I'm going to build an implant practice or not? Or is that well, not I, really? I, I have not done that. You know, I've heard some of my friends. I've heard good things. I've heard bad things. I've heard Dennis investing a lot of money in education with that. And to be honest with you, I, I'm not the person to ask with that because I have not got involved. Again, I don't participate with any insurance. Patients, I, I give them my fees. They pay it, we fill out the insurance paperwork, and they're reimbursed, whatever they get. That's life, you know. Okay, so here, here's, here's another question I get. They, they go to class, and they, the, the teacher's telling them, you know, the, the ideal implant patient, and then they're telling them, you know, the ones you'd like to stay away from, like smokers, fat, diabetes, all that. And then they get out in the real world. Well, you know, people who take care of themselves and go to the gym five times a week and don't smoke and exercise and eat kale for <laughs> breakfast, you know, they, they, they're usually not in the implant market. So you go right. open up your practice in downtown Oklahoma City, well, who's the ones losing all their teeth? Fat smokers, drinkers, you know, <laughs> alcoholics, bar fights. So talk about indications. Would well, you, do you place implants in smokers? There, there's... I tell my patients, every new patient, there's two criteria for people want implants. Number one, you have to be relatively healthy. Relatively healthy. What does that mean? Meaning no uncontrolled medical problems like uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, immunosuppressive diseases like AIDS and things like that. If they're controlled, you can be a controlled diabetic. You know, I, and I like to say if you're gardening and you, and you cut yourself on a rose, does it heal? You know, gentlemen, if you shave, in the morning and you cut yourself, does it heal? If, if the answer is yes, then I will place an implant. Smokers are kind of a unique thing because they, they'll look you right in the eye and they'll lie to you. Smoking can inhibit healing. It's very intuitive, right? If are you, you talking about, I, what, do, what do you mean they'll lie? Are you talking about smoking cigarettes or marijuana? Either, either or. It doesn't matter. Really? People, people are likely to deny that and they'll lie to you? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I'm putting a hole in the gum and they're going to they're going to light up a cigarette creating heat, tar, nicotine that's going to go into the gum. Smokers notoriously don't have a lot of um, a lot of bleeding because the circulation is diminished. So it, it compromises what we're what we're doing. But we have to think it through. Do I place implants in smokers? I do. Um, but they have to take some of the risks involved. Smokers, you bury the implant, you put extra stitches in there, you want to try to prote protect the bone as much as possible from, from smoking. But you have to be realistic. Smokers, you're going to see more implant failures, more bone loss with smokers than with non-smokers. Now, now I want to get to the, uh, as the, um, and by the way, a little history. You and I are old enough to know that, you know, when I was in dental school, the people placing implants were considered crazy. And, yep. and when I opened up in Phoenix, uh, there was a guy flying around an airplane putting implants, and they, they called him the flying butcher. I mean, I mean, it, it, and now it's all mainstay. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it was crazy how uh, those pioneers back in the 70s and the 80s took a lot of flat. Remember Ramus bars and subperiosteals oh, and all, the, all that stuff like that? Yeah, uh, see. <laughs> but now that there's been so many thousands and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of implants placed, a lot of these implants have been there a long time, and these kids are looking at this stuff, and 
The patient's fine because they can still chew a cheeseburger, onion ring, and a french fry, but it's periamplantitis, it's lost half its bone, it's bleeding, it's mushing, and the patient's like, I don't feel a thing, and I can eat a bacon cheeseburger. What are you saying? I'm going to take this out and replace it. Talk about periamplantitis. Uh, it seems like they can't even get a straight definition of when the implant has to be removed and when it has to be replaced. It's like periimplantitis, they just talk about this phenomena, but it's, it's not really a math equation where they say, well, it, when it gets to this, you pull it and replace it. Well, how, yeah, and, yeah. and how do you treat periimplantitis? You know, the, the, the more questions they ask, do you, do you treat them with, do you give them scripts of antibiotics? You know, what, what, what do you do? Well, you know, I don't, I don't replace very many of my own crowns. I replace other dentist crowns all the time. <laughs> right? right? So, so, you know, implants today, our modern implants, we do not see the issues that we saw in the past because they're engineered differently. The design, the threads, the drills, the motors, it's all different than it was when I started out. So we are not seeing, as long as they're correctly placed, good bone, healthy patient, relatively healthy patient, we're not seeing the bone loss. But when we do, when we do, oftentimes it's a, it's a prosthetic problem. I'm a big believer that our implants today are prosthetically driven. We design the, we place the implants in an ideal position for the teeth on top. We try to maintain tissue. Our margins are at the gingival line angle, not subgingival like they used to be. We don't. We we are. We use cements that are resorbable by the body, so we're not causing those issues. However, when we do develop problems, uh, bone loss, we have to be realistic on when and if we how we treat it. Do we flap it? We can graft things today. Um, we can, but our implant. The cost of implant materials has decreased so much that in my practice, I rarely try to, to fix a failing or ailing implant. I would rather take it out, graft it, and replace it at a reduced fee for the patient. Um, yes, antibiotics are helpful. Maintaining the, the tissue, getting rid of the source of the infection. However, if an implant's solid, and you mentioned and doesn't hurt, I don't necessarily jump on the bandwagon and try to remove it, especially if they're my own. If they're somebody else's, I may think about it. But that's just that's human nature, right? We like to be dentists are tough. We like to be critical of look at that open margin there. That you know, oh boy, that's you know, fifty microns more than I would have put that crown in. You know, how realistic is that in the real world? And you're a real world guy for sure. You know, when uh, Clinton was running for office and that girl asked him, you know, boxers or briefs. Those girls are all looking at you now and saying, are you a cementer or a screwer? That's the big, <laughs> that's really a big question. Are you a cementer or a screwer? Yeah, I'll, well, <laughs> it depends what time of day. No, uh, <laughs> the, the, I've always liked to cement crowns on, and there, there are rules that I follow. If you have five mil, you, you look at the interocclusal distance, and your abutment needs to be at least five millimeters tall to do a cement on crown. I do a lot of custom abutments. I like my margins to be at the gingival line angle. I don't like subgingival margins. Uh, and with the new new materials and crowns, my work is, I think it's beautiful. Not that I created it. My lab created some beautiful work. Um, when you don't have a lot of interocclusal space, then I will do a screw retain prosthesis. And that's the indication in my hands to do a screw retain prosthesis. Otherwise, if I have five millimeters or more, me personally, I will cement the crown on. And what but are you I, cementing it with? I use this. That's a great question. I, for 30 years, I have used a soft cement. I don't use temporary cement. To my patients, I use a soft cement. Because if you say temporary to a patient, it means, well, when are you going to put the permanent one in? I will use, in this order, I will use a tempon material. I will use uh, a eugenol based material like EBA. I will use Duralon. All three of those products are resorbed by the body cells. So if I did leave a little bit of material subgingival, the body will resorb it away. What I don't cement my implant crowns on with are glass ionomers or resin cements. Um, we do have a, a, a transitional implant material called Improv, I-M-P-R-O-V. But again, when you're doing your implant crowns and you're cementing, I just put a little ring of material. You don't fill it so that it gushes all over. You just put a little ring uh, so that the, the material itself will engage the abutment and, and hold it very well. 
That's what I use. That's what I've used for 30 years. And you know what's coming back? Um, zinc phosphate is actually coming back. For those of you who have glass slabs, don't throw them away. It's, it's coming again because it's resorbed by the body. And people are saying it's too hard to mix. I mean, your assistant mixes it. So yeah. what, do you, what do you care how hard it is? Yeah. I mean, my, yeah. I but, uh, the resin cements, and uh, I've seen too many abutments come loose. And if you put your implant crowns in with a hard cement and something comes loose, it's going to happen. You have to destroy the crown and start all over. I tell my patients the soft cement is like insurance. It allows me to remove it. As far as they're concerned, it's permanent. You know, um, humans are, uh, well, all animals are, are, they're tribal. I mean, you know, you watch these National Geographic films and, you know, some, uh, some female lion will try to leave her tribe and go to another tribe and the other girls will kill her. I mean, they, they won't let her in the tribe. And with tribalism is a lot of shaming and guilting and all this stuff. And, but some people, um, they, they feel shamed and dirty if they do a three and a bridge. And some people are like, God, man, you're a hack. You just file down. Two virgin teeth. I don't know what a virgin teeth is. I guess it's I guess it's a tooth that never got laid. And you know, you shaved down two virgin teeth and did a bridge, and you're a hack. Yeah, when I'm at the gym, I got some ENT guys, and one of them's a rhinologist, and he's like, sometimes he they, they get so mad, they're like, man, I saw a case today. Why would some dentist, you know, blow up in a, a sinus and stick a bunch of titanium and cow butt bone and all this paper clips and all this crap in there. And she had an infection and all the, all this cannabis and I had to scrape it all out. When you had two perfectly healthy teeth that you could have filed down and done a break. So I want to ask you this, and I know you're biased because you worship at the God of teeth because you're a dentist. Do, I mean, do you think that since you're a dentist, your God is, is enamel? And that's why you don't want to shave down enamel and you'll blow out a sinus and pack it with titanium and cow bone. But if you would have been an ear, nose, and throat, your God would have been a sinus and you would have just the hell with the enamel. Do you, do you think we have a bias towards sinus, lifts, and grafts just because we're dentists by nature? Well, well, you know, of course. You know, I, I, think we teach, I think we teach good, better, best. And again, I, I said this before, I, I'm a big believer in communication, educating the patient on the benefits and risks of, of both. You know, the final decision is really not mine. It's, it's theirs. If, if okay, they don't but, want an she, She's a 25-year-old dentist. She's, she's driving to work right now. She's commuting to some corporate dentist factories. What are the pros and cons of filing down? The, the most common implant is a first molar. What is the pros and cons of filing down the bicuspid molar versus a sinus graft in your mind today? You know, I think that's, a sinus that's, graft. That's a, that's a good debate. I mean, I, I like that because... You know, I, I try to put myself in, in, in the patient situation. With, with Knowing what I know now, this old guy sitting here, knowing what I know now, would I want anybody to grind down one of my teeth if they didn't have to? And the answer is no, because I know what can happen when you grind down a tooth. The margins can change. You get the dark line. I could need a root canal. I could have sensitivity. I wouldn't want to grind down a, my own healthy tooth. So it's easy for me to talk to a patient about filling that gap with my little piece of metal um, because it makes sense. Flossing, cleaning is easier. You know, one, it's easier to maintain long term. But if, if there's fillings on the teeth on either side, bridges are certainly a viable option. Um, I'd still do bridges. Of course I still do bridges. It'd be silly for me to say not, I, that I don't. But I think that, again... As this, the young woman, the 25-year-old driving in, listening to us today, I think that they have to understand what, what would they want in their mouth. Even with limited experience, they know what can happen, you know, because we've all done that. We, we've all, you know, we've, as far as filing down my teeth for a bridge, you know, after my vasectomy, I just don't care anymore. You know, it was just so, <laughs> it was just so dehumanizing, you know, knowing that I'm an old guy shooting blanks. No, my, my, last, my last question is this. The number one, and now, now I'm begging. I'm putting on my begging hat too, Tim. I, I really am begging. Um, you know, the largest asset 97, 98% of all Americans will ever own is their house. And one of the best things they can do on a fixed income is a reverse annuity. And, you know, why should grandma have all this money wrapped up in her house, die and give it to her grandkids so they can all go buy an eight ball of cocaine and quit their job and, you know, uh, you know become losers? So they do this reverse annuity, but they have to deconstruct the sales process. They, so their commercials are they get someone trustworthy, you're very trustworthy, 
and they say, you know, this is really a good deal, trust me, just call this number and we'll just send you a DVD. And then the DVD is a longer explanation and then it's like, look, until you call us and give us your address, we can't tell you what kind of money. So they deconstruct it and they, they string her along. And I just think, um, I, I know the Englands too. I, I know you're a legend. I know the Englands too would be the best decision. I know uh, they think $5,000 is a lot of money, but they'll pay it back in two cases. But I think you should deconstruct the uh, sales process for the millennials. And how I would recommend that is you got three courses. You got the mentoring one, two, and three. These are all three-day courses. On Dentaltown, um, we put up 350 uh, online CE courses. They've been viewed by millennials 600,000 times. And I think if you put up a one-hour teaser course for class one, class two, because she's never, she, you know, she doesn't know where this is. She just, she's only seeing your sound now. She doesn't know you're a gorgeous Polish guy from Detroit. You know, she just listens to your sound. But if she watched you or, or Dr. Engel, if, if she watched you for an hour, then that, that's a long way. Or, or I look at these, these uh, flyers in, in my own magazine, my ads in my own magazine. It's like a little ad that says fly all the way to Dominican Republic or fly all the way to, you know, Scottsdale or Koi Center and Seattle, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, you know what, you need that it's that's a big gap to go from who are you to flying across the country and dropping five grand. I would deconstruct the sales process. I think it'd be the best marketing you ever did. I think if you put up a, a, a course on uh, here's mentoring one, give them one hour of the greatest hits album, and then they'll come back for the three days. It's very counterintuitive. Because most people think, well, if I give them an hour, they won't come for the three days. Dude, no one's gonna get into the implant business without seeing a live surgery. You know, you, you're not awesome. going to learn how to play the piano watching YouTube. You're going to have right. to, you know, get your hands on it. But it would just be, I would just give anything to have you put Let's up an online CE course. I think it'd be great for the kids. I think it would deconstruct the sales process. And if they, if we can get them to one of these courses, they got another tool in their box, like say 5,000 bucks, two cases, uh, an Invisalign class. I mean, how could that cost money? I mean, if you can't do one Invisalign case, you should just turn your license in. You know, because they're they're asking you for that. I mean, they're they're coming in saying my teeth look like I can eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence. I'm never going to get married. I don't want to be a Catholic nun. Please straighten up my teeth. You know, but um, hey, I just want to tell you, I love it. Um, I, and I and I love your email. Can I give out your email over the phone over the podcast? Sure. I've never heard this ever. His email is all questions at smilecreator.net. That is just hilarious. It's so, it just, I, I've never seen that. All questions at smilecreator.net. Timothy Kosinski, and that's uh, Polish or Polish? Polish. <laughs> yeah, that was amazing. You said your wife's Polish, your wife, mom, and dad all born in Poland? Brother and sister. First generation, yep. So is your favorite uh, music, well, you're from Detroit, so who do you like more, Chopin or Kiss? Eminem, yeah. <laughs> Are you a Chopin fan? Eminem. 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 Oh, Eminem. When I was, uh, I've been to Poland three or four times. I went to the Chopin uh, Museum. Yes, there. That's Polish. They're they're more proud of that guy than anyone. But the the trick to uh, um, Chopin is that um, his thumb to pinkies uh, was so bizarrely wide that some of the best concert pianists in the world can't play his music because he's had these you know these long stretched fingers. But uh. Tim, I think what you're doing is amazing. I was so humbled and honored that you uh, gave me an hour of your time today. And I swear, if you put up three, uh, if you put up an hour course for each one of your programs, it'll be the best marketing you could done. And uh, just thank you so much today for being on my show. Thank you. I appreciate you too. Good seeing you. All right, buddy. Have a great day.